So this is the ladies' side, and that's the men's side. <laughs> I'm just checking. That's all. Okay. Back to the good old days. <laughs> The men have all this effulgence. Which I think it's due to these four lights, because <laughs> I can't see you. All I can see is the lights. Okay. Is those lights supposed to be f for your re taping? Yeah. If you just you just turn it towards you a little bit, yeah, that way. Yeah, keep going in that direction. face it a little bit differently. That's good. Yeah, that's that's excellent actually. Is that all right for you? No, turn it turn it some more so you get your light and yeah, if you turn it the lights towards that way instead of towards me, yeah. Now keep going. That's it. One more. One more twist. Is that good for you? Okay, that's all right for me. It's a little less the ladies get the lights in their eyes now. Let there be light. Hmm, this is, let's see, fourth canto. Oh, this is part two in the old set. I was thinking part two in the new set. I need chapter 30. Three zero. Or chapter part four, I guess, four four. No. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prastaya Bhutale, Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prachari Nangi Vrsesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine. Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasari Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, that was a request for a particular topic tonight. <coughs> How to love each other and not kill each other. That's the... <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> similar, similar. The idea, the, the pitch to part is how devotees can learn to work together. <clears throat> but this is even more um, focused. This is a verse from the fourth canto, chapter 30, text number 8. And this is Krishna speaking. 
He's talking to uh, nine brothers who are called the Prachetas. And Krishna is pleased by the uh, behavior of the Prachetas and he expresses his pleasure by saying, My dear sons of the king, referring to King Prachini Barhisha, who is a very noteworthy. I'm very much pleased by the friendly relationships amongst you, all engaged in one occupation, devotional service. I'm so pleased with your mutual friendship that I wish you all good fortune. Now you may ask a benediction from me. So, um, the purpose goes explains that since the sons of King Prachini Bhariship were all united in Krishna consciousness, the Lord was very pleased with them. Each and every one of the sons of the king was an individual soul, but they were all united in offering transcendental service to the Lord. The unity of individual souls attempting to satisfy the Supreme Lord or rendering service to the Lord is real unity. In the material world, such unity is not possible. Even though people may officially unite, they all have different interests. <coughs> so here, there is only one goal in Krishna consciousness, to serve Krishna to the best of one's ability. If there's some disagreement over service, such agreement is considered to be spiritual, not material. Those who are actually engaged in the service of the Lord cannot be united in, in any circumstances. So, Srila Prabhupada's purport very much illustrates uh, the importance of the success of anything we do, in, and that is unity and cooperation. When Prabhupada, um, when Prabhupada was asked just before he left the planet, uh, when you're gone, Srila Prabhupada, how can we please you? Hare Krishna. He said that uh, if you want to please me, cooperate together to push on this Krishna consciousness movement. So cooperation in the material world is not possible, although people have what we say attempts at cooperation, and there's a lot of organizations to establish cooperation, there's no real center. The center is me. In other words, I am the center, and we cooperate for my interests, but because I can satisfy my interests by cooperating with you, then I cooperate with you. Sounds good? It's material world. That's how material life works. That people are willing to cooperate if they can fulfill their interests. So that's why Prabhupada said the United Nations is an attempt for unity and cooperation. But there's no unity and no cooperation because it's all about my nation. <laughs> Whereas in spiritual circles, there is a common goal or a common interest. And my interest is fulfilled by serving the common interest. And that is to serve Krishna <laughs> or to engage in devotional service. So the unity of individuals working together on the spiritual platform is real unity because the focus is Krishna or the focus is to serve Krishna. The focus is a common goal to become Krishna conscious by serving Krishna, by cooperating together. So in the material world, it's very hard for people to cooperate, especially in this age of Kali. There's so much reasons for disagreement, and people will always find reasons to disagree or not to cooperate, to, to maintain this false sense of individuality, which people just struggle with. And, and gradually, things become more and more, what they say, fragmented. You'll see, if you just observe how the world works, there's more and more groups. This group, that group, this group, that group. And they're always creating new groups because nobody can get along with anybody. 
<laughs> it's just the way, even in the families, even brothers and sisters, and nobody, it's just the way this world is. Because in Kali Yuga, it's at, exacerbated because of the nature of the age, is that because every functionally, materially and spiritually, uh, what we say, individuality and uncooperation is everywhere. <laughs> Even in spiritual circles, you find that going on. But Prabhupada says, even if there's a disagreement in how to serve, still there is unity because the goal is to serve. One may say, I want to serve this way, another one may want to serve that way. But as long as the goal is the same, is to serve Krishna, to serve the instructions of the spiritual teachers, there is unity based on that principle of service to the higher, to the authority, like that. And how to work together to create that atmosphere is that by, Krishna says in, the, in one particular Purana, which is not a very um, often quoted Purana, it's called the Adi Purana. Krishna says, one who says my, he's my devotee is not my devotee, but one who says he's the devotee of my devotee is actually my devotee. <laughs> So to become a devotee of Krishna, one has to become a devotee of Krishna's devotee. So by serving Krishna's devotee, and by serving all of Krishna's devotees, in other words, having the service mood towards everyone, one actually develops a strong service attitude towards Krishna. It's understood in the sense that um, the mood is to serve. And the mood is to cooperate. In the, in, in the material world, um, everything is motivated by personal interest. Of course, our personal interest is to become conscious. So there is, a, it's almost like a catch-22. You have to forget about yourself in order to help yourself. In other words, you have to focus on the source of everything in Krishna's service and Krishna's devotees, and then that's the best thing you can do for yourself. Why? Because that's your nature. Individual nature is servant to love. The expression of love is in the form of service. There's no other way to express, there's two ways to express love, cooperation and service. And service with cooperation is real service. <laughs> and the basic principle of that is that uh, I, I'm serving you for your pleasure, I'm serving Krishna for Krishna's pleasure. And I find my fulfillment in that, not so much what I'm getting. There are three modes of material nature, and we speak about that. Krishna defines what are the modes of material nature. And one of the modes is the mode of passion. The mode of passion is the, the mode of activity where one seeks a particular result from what they do a particular type of result, or maybe any kind of result. In other words, something, some reciprocation. Prabhupada would use the example that no one in the material world will do anything without considering what is what will I will get from it, or what I will gain from it. But in the spiritual world, there's no con in spiritual circles, that mood is different. The mood is to serve for the same service. And that way one becomes satisfied. Why? Because that's our nature. Our nature is to serve. <laughs> you can't, either we serve materially with motivated interest, or we say, oh, spare, serve Krishna without motivation. Or if we serve Krishna with motivation, we also get something, but we don't get Krishna. <laughs> we get a little bit of what we say, protection from the material energy, and some, some freedom from some suffering. But we don't get Krishna. When we serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure, and serving Krishna for Krishna's pleasure is learning how to serve Krishna's devotees. <laughs> so it says to learn how to see oneself in others. Now that's a very difficult statement. How to see one, see one's own interest in others, self. <laughs> what is my interest? What is my needs? What are my activities? What are my consequences? and fulfilling the desires of others in a way that, that other, those other persons benefit by your service. 
And that's love. And that's bhakti. Bhakti really means love. And love means to serve. And serve means to serve for the pleasure of the beloved or the object of one's service. <laughs> so I was asked to speak like how to lift one each other up and not tear each other down in our association with each other. Well, that's easy. Just try to serve, that's all. And that's a certain mindset. The mindset is how can I serve, not what can I get from what I'm doing. It's just, just switching for you. What can I do for Krishna? What can I do for the spiritual master? And even if it's something insignificant, in terms of the activity, is powerful because it's it's the mood that counts and not so much the activity. It's the mood that counts. That's why Krishna says in the Gita, Patram Pushpam Falam Toyam Yome Bhakta Panasyati Taraham Bhakta Uparitam. He gives a very simple but very powerful formula that he says, just offer me a leaf, a flower, a fruit, a water, which are so easily available. Now, why would God ask for such things? Because, he, you know, he, he doesn't say, give me a million dollars, or give me, your, you know, or give me your life. He says, just give me these simple things with love. He wants love. That's what he's interested in, not in the objects. So to, to show that he's only interested in the love, he makes the objects so easily simple. And when we understand that principle, that's the principle of happiness. To somehow or other satisfy Krishna, satisfy Krishna's devotees by whatever else we do. And that takes cooperation. And cooperation means to take yourself out of the center. <laughs> and that somebody else says, well, I'm number one. There's a lot of ones. But there's only one one. <laughs> no one, there's only, there, can, there only can be one one. And then one, two, one, three, like that. So in the same way, there's only one center. And that's, when we're in the center, then we're blocking the real center. So take yourself out of the center, and you actually you become the center. <laughs> in the sense that you fulfill your own needs through the needs of others. Like that. Just like in the material world, they did a service. And this is a very common materialistic gallop poll. They wanted to find out what was, who were the happiest types of people? What is their occupation? What is their uh, nature? So the survey was done in America, and the conclusion was the happiest types of people are those who are very active, busy, using their time, and ser serving others. <laughs> Even in the material world, a person gets some satisfaction doing good for others like that. Of course, it's motivated because they want to be known as a good a do-gooder or whatever else. Maybe to get some thank you very much for all the nice things you're doing. They want some reciprocation. But at least it's the principle of selflessness, even in a material sense. But in a spiritual sense, that is the actual profit. That is the actual foundation for operation, to serve Krishna for Krishna's pleasure, to serve Krishna's devotees for, in order to inspire them. It's like when you meet a devotee, what do you think? Jai Sri Sri Radha Gopi Vallabha Ki Jai Sri Sri Gornitai Ki Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki Jai so there are three, now let's get a little bit more specific in the category of devotees. There are three categories of persons, we might say. There are those who are more senior to us in the spiritual realm, spiritual circles. There are those who are equal, and those who are maybe junior, people who are just coming in. So there's three ways to relate to that. Where is that other... Oh. Let's see. Can you give me chapter number eight? This begins with chapter nine. That's, I think that's fourth canto part one. Now it says that in the uh, three categories, one should relate to each category different. 
in the those who are more advanced spiritually, we take instructions from them, take guidance from them, and serve them. For those who are equal, we make friends and share Krishna consciousness. For those who are in a lesser position, we try to raise them up by seeing what, how to serve them by giving them Krishna consciousness. So then you might say that's kind of, that's the mood of doya. Doya means compassion or mercy, giving out mercy to others. So you'll find yourself, and this is the way of the world, we're always in contact with one of these three types. Somebody who's more advanced, somebody who's equal, and someone, and Prabhupada writes, if I could get the verse, I could read it, that if one practices this mood of relationship, one will be free from all material suffering. We want to become free from the, the pangs of the material energy, the difficulties that come by having a material body and being in the material world, which is numerous difficulties, then this mood of relationship is the basis for freeing ourselves from all material suffering. And the, what we say, the counterpart or the material aspect of this relationship is when one is superior, we tend to envy them. When someone is equal, we want to prove that we are such a nice devotee. We want to, uh, what is it? <clears throat> we explain how wonderful it is to have a, such a nice person as me as your friend, like that. You don't really know how great, how lucky you are to have me as your friend. <laughs> and the and when we find someone less, we feel good. We try to keep them down, leave them down by degrade, not degrading them, but what's the word? Uh, yeah, criticizing, but demeaning them. Yeah, or, or make or feel, feeling superior, and that makes us feel good because somebody's lesser. <laughs> So these are the counterpart, the material counterpart. The devotee is acting according to these three, and these, and, and it's explained in the shastras by the acharyas that this partition. You, you found no. Okay. This is how you show your love for Krishna. Every man should act like this. When he meets a person more qualified than himself, he should be very pleased. When he meets someone less qualified than himself, he should be compassionate. And when he meets someone equal to himself, he should make friendships with them, with him. In this way, one is never affected by the threefold miseries of the material world. Generally, when we find someone more qualified than ourselves, we become envious. When we find someone less qualified, we deride them. And when we find someone equal, we become very proud of our activities. These are the causes of all material tribulations. The great sage Narada therefore advised that a devotee should act perfectly. Instead of being envious of a more qualified person, one should be jolly to receive him. Instead of being oppressive to a less qualified person, one should be compassionate just to raise them up to the proper standard. And when one meets an equal, instead of being proud of one's own activities before him, one should treat him as a friend. One should also have compassion for people in general who are suffering due to forgetfulness of Krishna. These important functions will make one happy within this material world. So here's the platform of freedom from miseries, learning how to relate to others according so there has to be some knowledge of what is, the na what is the relationship with others. But that preliminary understanding will help us in the practice of our devotional service. And the Acharyas explain that in our showing love for Krishna means learning how to express our, these proper relationships with each and every individual. In other words, you love Krishna by serving Krishna's devotees, that are in a better position. You love Krishna by making friends with others who are equal. You love Krishna by showing compassion to those who are in a less situation. So these fundamental principles are sound, sounds very simple, but it takes practice. 
And it takes, as it says, to get, get ourselves out of the center. It's difficult in the Kali Yuga because the way we live, the lifestyle we live, forces us to all to become focused on our individual needs and selves because it's such a struggle to live in this world. So a better lifestyle would be more of a communal lifestyle where people have a tendency to depend on each other and work with each other in a broader sense. And that would help to develop this, this consciousness more easily and more naturally. But because we don't have that, we have to practice these things very carefully. Envy. Envy is what causes the living entity to fall to the material world. It's explained that the, or the original sin is envy. Envy of what? Krishna. Krishna is what? Krishna is Bhokta, he's the enjoyer, and he is also the controller. He controls everything, and everything is meant for his enjoyment. Bhoktaram Yagya, Stapasam Sarvaloka Maheshwaram, Suhidam Sarvabhutanam, Yantam Mam Shantam Rajchiti. So Krishna explains in the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita that he's the enjoyer. And he's inviting us to enjoy with him, but ultimately he, the enjoyment comes by making him enjoy. <laughs> and he's the controller. And in order to be the enjoyer, you also have to be the controller. So the counterpart is when the living entity comes to the material world, due to wanting to be the enjoyer and the controller, he tries to take the position of Krishna. And tries to control in order to enjoy. And that hard struggle for existence, which is unnatural, causes the living entity so many material miseries. So taking oneself out of the center and putting Krishna and devotees, other devotees, Krishna and the spiritual, back into the center means to put yourself back into the center in the real sense of the word. Because we can only be happy or we can only find progress in spiritual life when we understand our relationship with others. To not understand a relationship means that to not act in the proper way. And that relationship is based on the principle of cooperation and the principle of service like that. So it takes practice. Therefore, in this material world, Prabhupada said, everyone is envious of everyone else because in the initial sin is the envy of, envious of Krishna. I want to control, I want to enjoy. <laughs> it's not possible to be the controller. It is possible to be the enjoyer, but only in the sense that Krishna becomes the center of enjoyment. Prabhupada said, you also enjoy. <laughs> And someone asked Prabhupada, how do we know when Krishna is pleased? And Prabhupada said, when you're pleased. <laughs> in other words, when you do your devotional service in such a way and that you do something to please Krishna, and Krishna is pleased because you're connected with Krishna, you are Krishna's part and parcel. The soul is a fragment of Krishna. Krishna is, Krishna is the complete whole. We are fragments of that whole. We're not separate from Krishna, we're always connected to Krishna. And when we connect with Krishna through devotional service, we feel that connection, we experience that connection. And when Krishna is pleased by our devotional service, you also feel pleased. So that's the key. The whole material world is working on the opposite principle. Is that I'm the center and just focus on yourself, you're number one. And that's all that counts. <laughs> and that's why there's so many problems. So, um, therefore, this idea of envy comes when one wants to be something they're not. <laughs> what is that, the enjoyer? Just like the whole idea of violence towards en animals is another feature of envy. I don't want you to live... I want to exploit you for my sense gratification because, and therefore I kill you. That is called envy towards the other living entities in the form of animals. That whole process of exploitation of nature, exploitation of each other, exploitation of 
other li of animals is simply based on the principle of envy. And envy is the root is the root anarth of all the anarthas. From envy comes everything else: pride, lust, anger, delusion, greed, and all the other problems that the living entity faces day to day in the struggle for practicing devotional service, or even in this material world. So Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, in the very first verse of the ninth chapter, which is considered the most confidential knowledge, he says, he says to Arjun, he says, because you are never envious of me, I impart you this most secret wisdom, knowing which you'll be free from all the miseries of the material energy. So Krishna is speaking to Arjun because he knows Arjun is not envious. So the quality of not envy allows one to be open to the message of Krishna, to hear the message of Krishna. We have to hear with an open heart, with the desire to understand, with the desire to, to practice devotional service. So um, by, and envy is overcome by the attitude of service. It's like Prabhupada used to tell us, I never asked my spiritual master very much, but I did ask him one question, how can I serve? <laughs> That's the most important question one can ask, how can I serve? And how can I serve in such a way as to please, not only to serve, but to serve in a pleasing way, like that. So this is the principle of happiness, it's the principle of life, and it's the basic principle of bhakti yoga. Whatever we do, our chanting, our reading, our worshiping, our association, if we don't develop a service mentality in that association with others, we will never taste the happiness of devotional service. We might, we, if we think that I'll serve because of what I'll get from it, then that is considered to be a low platform. There are four categories of motivations. To serve because if I don't, I'll get smashed. Me. Hell. You'll die. Hell is now. You know, so they, they, they try to play on your fear motivation for activity. But that's like, that's what you do with a child because a child can't understand philosophy, so you say, if you don't be good, I'm going to slap you. I'm not going to give you your cookie. You, know, you use some kind of fear aspect to get something from the person. That's, that's, we also speak about that in the, in the scriptures, about the negativity of not serving. But we don't emphasize that as a motivation for service. The next platform is, uh, I'll serve because I'm going to be happy. My happiness is the motivation for my service. And if it doesn't look like I'm going to be happy, or if I'm not feeling happy, I lose my enthusiasm. Or I even lose my desire to serve. A little better than that is duty. I must serve because it's my duty. It's my, I'm part and parcel of Krishna. I'm Krishna's eternal servant. So I'll serve. I'm not worried about my happiness. Whatever comes, it's my duty to serve. And the highest platform, the loving way, I want to show my love for Krishna by doing service to Krishna. Or I'm motivated by love. So if we're motivated by happiness, that is not a steady platform change according to the circumstance. So one should try to serve at least that way. And serve nicely. It doesn't matter how much service you do as opposed to what is the quality of the service you offer. And it's just like we use, always say, if you chant one name, not the, not the whole mantra, the mantra has 16 names in it. If you chant one name purely you're free from all sinful reactions that you ever have possibly committed in every lifetime. 
just one name purely. In other words, that's how bhakti works. It works on quality. Quantity, quantity we emphasize. Why? Because quantity enhances the possibility of quality. The more you practice something, the better you get at it. So there's where, there's where quantity comes in. But ultimately we're looking for quality. We're trying to do, to serve in such a way that we can offer the best in everything we do. With, in the best means, I do it in the best possible way with a desire to please the object. Like that. You do that with Krishna, and we should do that with you. When you're with other devotees, you think, how can I serve this person? That should be our thought. What can I do for that person that will will be a, a service to that person? You might, you might also, if that person is maybe a little off, you might also chastise them. But that's service. <laughs> that's service. It's always for the benefit of the other. How it comes out takes some intelligence to see the situation. But if the motivation is there, then Krishna will help us understand how best to serve in every situation. Like that. Imagine if everybody did, you know, did that. If imagine the husband always thinking how to serve the wife, the wife is always thinking how to serve the, the, the husband, the parents are always thinking how to serve the children, the children are always thinking how to serve the parents. Everything would be nice, right? But everyone's thinking, how can you serve me? Come on, come up. I'm here, I'm number one, right? <laughs> That's a problem. Well, the idea is to keep Krishna or devotional principles in the center, and in that way we're always in the best possible situation. Even if we don't serve perfectly, at least if we know that Krishna is the center of all activities, we're in the best possible consciousness like that. Krishna or Krishna's devotees. And the opposite is um, not to somehow cause distress to others. Causing distress can be done in a different way, through mind, through body, and through words. Uh, through mind, just a negative attitude, through words by speaking, harshly or offensively or just not acknowledging another person's needs or existence and through body being very what we say violent so we see we that example is there in the shastras when they wanted to test who was the best of all personalities of godhead they asked brigamudi to find out so he went he went first to brahma and brahma was his father Brahma came to greet him. Brigo didn't, didn't, didn't acknowledge his father's existence. Brahma became angry. Brigo left, went to Shiva. Shiva, when he went to the boat of Shiva, Shiva got up to acknowledge the presence of Brigo, who was his brother. And he said, oh, my brother, Brigo, you've come. Brigo said, don't touch me. You're <laughs> you are hanging around crematoriums, snakes, and so many other things, ashes all over. Shiva got so mad he was about to annihilate him. Parvati saved him. And she's calmed down Shiva a lot. It's good to have a good wife. You know. <laughs> so, and uh, the last was when he went to Lord Vishnu. He went immediately up to Vishnu and Vishnu welcomed him. Brigo, you've come. He, he kicked, Brigo, Brigo kicked him in the chest. And the Lord's response was, Oh, Brigo, is your foot hurt? My chest is very hard. I'm a Kshatriya, so let me massage your foot. So then the Lord could, un then Brigo could understand, actually, yes, he he here is the real personality of Godhead. And you see on the body of Lord Jagannath, you can see there's a footprint right on the chest of the deity. They have it in some deities. That's the kick of Brigo. The Lord put, wears that on his chest as the mark of his, the glory of his own devotee. So this nice story illustrates that you know one can commit offenses in three different ways, and one each one is more severe. So the devotee should avoid possibly causing harm, when we say discourse, to any living entity. 
Even if one causes discourse to oneself, one should not retaliate in the same way. One may have to protect oneself by removing oneself from the situation, but to retaliate makes you just as guilty as the perpetuator. Of course, you may have to defend yourself in certain situations, but the idea is tit for tat, that is material. When you say something bad to me and I say something bad to you. <laughs> And we just go on, and there's no, or vice versa. So a devotee is always thinking how to serve. That's it. how best to serve. And Krishna, within the heart, will inspire that devotee according to the situation, if that is our consciousness. And those who practice that will find that they can be in any situation with any types of people and feel comfortable because it's not about them it's about everybody else sometimes we feel comfortable around certain types of people and we feel uncomfortable around and, and that's natural but when we have a service mood that is a lot and we can be with so many different types of people and not think you know what's it, what it, what's in it for me just think how best i can serve that's all and that's what, that's what inspires one uh, to, to receive the mercy of the Lord. The Lord is very merciful to one who is always in the mood of service. Okay, so I was asked to speak on this subject tonight. How to get along and not to, you know, take each other down. <laughs> we want to lift each other up if... Sometimes they say, if I can lift you up going up and you going down. Sometimes they say like that. But if we can both go up, that's good. <laughs> Any questions? It attributes... Um, from what side are you speaking about? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Some fault in that person's service? Not necessarily. Not necessarily a bad motive. By, uh, okay. Well, you're, you're, you're making nice advancement, and I'm, I'm thinking... This is, I feel lousy, I feel bad. So, I, you know, I might speak badly about you. You may have good qualities, but I, have, I can speak badly about you. It's like, for example, what Daksha did to Shiva. Shiva had all good qualities, but Daksha found some kind of fault by his own mental concoction and tried to, t and took, tried to criticize Shiva. So, the mentality of that your happiness is my suffering. <laughs> that we want to get rid of. <laughs> Bhaktivinoda Thakur writes that in one of his prayers, speaking about the point from the point of a conditioned soul, how one feels happy when others are unhappy and feels unhappy when others are happy. So when we see someone else's service and there's, you know, to look for a fault, to find a fault like that, that means there's something wrong with us. <laughs> even if a person has, you should try to see the good qualities, even aside from the faults. Yeah, you might see the, yeah, that's, that's the normal position of seeing. It's not... It's hard to see only good qualities. That's a higher stage. But when you see the faults and the good qualities, you have a choice. What are you going to focus on? Or even if you see the faults, you look for the good qualities. That's Vaishnava. Vaishnava sees, oh, this person may have some faults, but also they have so many nice qualities. And that's, that's how we develop real relationships with each other. 
Because if you find fault with others, Krishna will find fault with you. And she, he's really expert at finding fault with Krishna. He can show you all your faults all at once and you'll be overwhelmed at one. <laughs> so if we, Krishna won't do that to us. He'll help us gradually get, come up to a higher stage in a very nice way. But if we find fault with others, he's going to show us, well, you think you're so pure, here's what you look like. <laughs> so that's, that's, we should avoid it. There's, there's, there's the daksha mentality, that's the lowest. The daksha mentality is you have uh, good qualities, but I somehow or other I'm going to find a fault and make that public. That's called blast. Take the faults out of your mind, you, you reject them, you, don't, you focus on the good qualities. A higher stage is that when you see faults, you s so we may not be on the highest platform, you see no faults at all. That's for Mahabhagavad. But we can at least not focus on a person's negativity or faults. You know. We should be compassionate. Even if we see that, we should think, what can I do to serve or help like that? Raise them up instead of keeping them down or making yourself feel good because they're, they have this. And if you're not strong enough, if their faults affect you so much, then just offer a nice prayer. If, you, if there's sometimes people who have faults, they have strong personalities and they want to, you know, and it affects you, you may not be able to associate, but at least you can not think in a negative way. You just avoid that association. <laughs>